Hello. And welcome to Larry Library. All right. Uh, that, now, now I know they're mocking like me. What? Hello. Welcome to Larry's Library. Hang on. I need to get a drink. You know. Got my Dixie Chicken sticker there. I'm a uh, little shout out to the Dixie Chicken uh, rainstorm uh, damaged their uh, ceiling a couple of days ago. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Uh, the snake even made it okay. But uh, happy thoughts and prayers out for uh, Katie and Jennifer. And hopefully they can get the Dixie Chicken repaired soon. Uh, now, Pinocchio chapters... 22 and 23. Chapter 22. Pinocchio discovers the robbers and as a reward for his fidelity is set at liberty. Because our poor Pinocchio is serving as a watchdog right now. He had been sleeping heavily for about two hours when, towards midnight, he was roused by a whispering of strange voices that seemed to come from the courtyard. Putting the point of his nose out of the kennel, he saw four little beasts with dark fur that looked like cats standing consulting together. But they were not cats. They were pole cats. Carnivorous little animals, especially greedy for eggs and young chickens. One of the pole cats, leaving his companions, came to the opening of the kennel and said in a low voice, Good evening, Malampo. My name is not Malampo, answered the puppet. Oh, then who are you? I am Pinocchio. And what are you doing here? Oh, I am acting as watchdog. Then where is Malampo? Where is the old dog who lived in this kennel? He died this morning. Is he dead? Poor beast, he was so good. But judging you by your face, I should say that you were also a good dog. I beg your pardon? I am not a dog. Not a dog? Then what are you? I am a puppet. And you are acting as watchdog? That is only too true, as a punishment. Well, then, I will offer you the same conditions that we made with the deceased Malampo, and I am sure you will be satisfied with them. What are these conditions? One night in every week you are to permit us to visit this poultry yard, as we have hitherto done, and to carry off eight chickens. Of these chickens, seven are to be eaten by us, and one we will give to you on the express understanding, however, that you pretend to be asleep, and that it never enters your head to bark to wake the present, the peasant. Did Malampo act in this manner? asked Pinocchio. Certainly, and we were always on the best terms with him. Sleep quietly and rest assured that before we go, we will leave by the kennel a beautiful chicken ready plucked for your breakfast tomorrow. Have we understood each other clearly? Only too clearly, answered Pinocchio, and he shook his head threateningly as much, to say, as, much as to say, You shall hear of this shortly. The four polecats, thinking themselves safe, repaired to the poultry yard, which was close to the kennel, and having opened the wooden gate with their teeth and claws, they slipped in one by one. But they had only just passed through when they heard the gate shut behind them with great violence. It was Pinocchio who had shut it, and for greater security he put a large stone against it to keep it closed. He then began to bark, and he barked exactly like, your, like a watchdog. <laughs> Hearing the barking, the peasant jumped out of bed, and taking his gun, he came to the window and asked, What is the what's the matter? Uh, they're all robbers, answered Pinocchio. Where are they? In the poultry yard. I will come down directly. In fact, in less time than it takes to say amen, the peasant came down. He rushed into the poultry yard, caught the polecats, and having put them into a sack, he said to them in a tone of great satisfaction, at last you have fallen into my hands. I might punish you, but I am not so cruel. I will content myself instead by carrying you in the morning to the innkeeper of the neighboring village who will skin and cook you as hares with a sweet and sour sauce. Well, at least he didn't kill him. Oh. It is an honor that you don't deserve, but generous people like me don't, deserve, don't consider such trifles. He then approached Pinocchio and began to caress him, and amongst other things he asked of him, How did you manage to discover the four thieves? To think that Malampo, my faithful Malampo, never found out anything. The puppet might then have told him the whole story. He might have informed him of the disgraceful conditions that, he had, that had been made between the dog and the polecats. But he remembered that the dog was dead, and he thought to himself, What is the good of accusing the dead? The dead are dead, and the best thing to be done is to leave them in peace. 
When the thieves got into the yard, were you asleep or awake? The peasant went on to ask him. I was asleep, answered Pinocchio. But the polecats woke me with their chatter, and one of them came to the kennel and said to me, If you promise not to bark and to not wake the master, we will make you a present of a fine chicken ready plucked. To think that they should have had the audacity to make such a proposal to me. For although I am a puppet, possessing perhaps nearly all the faults in the world, there is one that I certainly will never be guilty of, that of making terms with and sharing in the gains of dishonest people. Well said, my boy, cried the peasant, slapping him on the shoulder. Such sentiments do you honor, and as proof of my gratitude, I will at once set you at liberty, and you may return home. And he removed the dog's collar. So we move on to chapter 22. Pinocchio mourns the death of the beautiful child. Pinocchio mourns the death of the beautiful child with the blue hair. A pigeon flies with him to the seashore, and there he throws himself into the water to go to the assistance of his father Geppetto. As soon as Pinocchio was released from the heavy and humiliating weight of the dog collar, he started off across the fields and never stopped until he had reached the high road that led to the fairy's house. There he turned and looked down into the plain beneath. He could see distinctly with his naked eye the wood where he had been so unfortunate as to meet the fox and the cat. He could see amongst the trees the top of the big oak to which he had been hung. But although he looked in every direction, the little house belonging to the beautiful child with the blue hair was nowhere visible. Seized with a sad presentiment, he began to run with all the strength he had left, and in a few minutes he reached the field where the little white house had once stood. But the little white house was no longer there. He saw instead a marble stone on which were engraved these sad words. Here lies the child with the blue hair, who died from sorrow because she was abandoned by her little brother Pinocchio. Oh man, that's horrible. I leave you to imagine the puppet's feelings when he had with difficulty spelt out this epitaph. He fell with his face on the ground and, covering the tombstone with a thousand kisses, burst into an agony of tears. He cried all night, and when morning came, he was still crying, although he had no tears left, and his sobs and lamentations were so acute and heartbreaking that they roused the echoes in the surrounding hills. And as he wept, he said, Oh, little fairy, why did you die? Why did not I die instead of you? I, who am so wicked, whilst you were so good. And my papa, where can he be? Oh, little fairy, tell me where I can find him, for I want to remain with him always and never to leave him again, never again. Oh, little fairy, tell me that it is not true that you are dead. If you really love me, if you really love your little brother, come to life again, come to life as you were before. Does it not grieve you to see me alone and abandoned by everybody? If assassins come, they will hang me again to the branch of a tree, and then I shall die indeed. What do you imagine that I can do here alone in the world, now that I have lost you and my papa, who will give me food? Where shall I go to sleep at night? Who will make me a new jacket? Oh, it would be better, a hundred times better, that I should die also. Yes, I want to die. I, I. And in his despair, he tried to tear his hair, but his hair being made of wood, he could not even have the satisfaction of sticking his fingers into it. Just then, a large pigeon flew over his head and, stopping with distended wings, called down to him from a great height, Tell me, child, what are you doing there? Don't you see? I am crying, said Pinocchio, raising his head towards the voice and rubbing his eyes with his jacket. Tell me, continued the pigeon, amongst your companions, do you happen to know a puppet who is called Pinocchio? Pinocchio, did you say Pinocchio? repeated the puppet, jumping quickly to his feet. I am Pinocchio. The pigeon at this answer descended rapidly to the ground. He was larger than a turkey. Do you also know Geppetto? he asked. If I know him, he is my poor papa. Has he perhaps spoken to you of me? Will you take me to him? Is he still alive? Answer me for pity's sake. Is he still alive? I left him three days ago on the seashore. What was he doing? He was building a little boat for himself to cross the ocean. For more than three months, that poor man has been going all around the world looking for you. Not having succeeded in finding you, he has now taken it into his head to go into the distant countries <coughs> to the distant countries of the new world in search of you. How far is it from here to the shore? asked Pinocchio breathlessly. More than six hundred miles. Six hundred miles? Oh, beautiful pigeon, what a fine thing it would be to have your wings. If you wish to go, I will carry you there. Oh, I'll stride on my back. Do you weigh much? I weigh next to nothing. I am light as a feather. 
And without waiting for more, Pinocchio jumped at once on the pigeon's back, and putting a leg on each side of him as men do on horseback, he exclaimed joyfully, Gallop, gallop, my little horse, for I am anxious to arrive quickly. The pigeon took flight, and in a few minutes had soared so high that they almost touched the clouds. Finding himself at such an immense height, the puppet had the curiosity to turn and look around, but his head spun around, and he became so frightened that to save himself from the danger of falling, he wound his arms tightly round the neck of his feathered steed. They flew all day. Towards evening, the pigeon said, uh, I am very thirsty, and I am very hungry, rejoined Pinocchio. Let us stop at that dovecot for a few minutes, and then we will continue our journey that we may reach the seashore by dawn tomorrow. They went into a deserted dovecot, where they found nothing but a basin full of water and a basket full of vetch. The puppet had never in his life been able to eat vetch. According to him, it made him sick and revolted him. That evening, however, he ate to repletion, and when he had nearly emptied the basket, he turned to the pigeon and said to him, I never could have believed that vetch was so good. Be assured, my boy, replied the pigeon, that when hunger is real and there is nothing else to eat, even vetch becomes delicious. Hunger knows neither caprice nor greediness. Having quickly finished their little meal, they recommenced their journey and flew away. The following morning they reached the seashore. The pigeon placed Pinocchio on the ground, and not wishing to be troubled with thanks for having done a good action, flew quickly away and disappeared. The shore was crowded with people who were looking out to sea, shouting and gesticulating. What has happened? asked Pinocchio of an old woman. A poor father who has lost his son has gone away in a boat to search for him on the other side of the water, and today the sea is tempestuous, and the little boat is in danger of sinking. Where is the little boat? It is out there in a line with my finger, said the old woman, pointing to a little boat which, seen at that distance, looked like a nutshell with a very little man in it. Pinocchio fixed his eyes on it, and after looking attentively, he gave a piercing scream, crying, It is my papa! It is my papa! The boat, meanwhile, beaten by the fury of the waves, at one moment disappeared in the trough of the sea, and the next came again to the surface. Pinocchio, standing on the top of a high rock, kept calling to his father by name, and making every kind of signal to him with his hands, his handkerchief, and his cap. And although he was so far off, Geppetto appeared to recognize his son, for he also took off his cap and waved it, and tried by gestures to make him understand that he would have returned if it had been possible, but that the sea was so tempestuous that he could not use his oars or approach the shore. Suddenly a tremendous wave rose, and the boat disappeared. They waited, hoping it would come again to the surface, but it was seen no more. Poor man, said the fishermen who were assembled on the shore, and murmuring a prayer, they turned to go home. Just then they heard a desperate cry, and looking back, they saw a little boy who exclaimed as he jumped from a rock into the sea, I will save my papa! Pinocchio, being made of wood, floated easily, and he swam like a fish. At one moment they saw him disappear under the water, carried down by the fury of the waves, and next he reappeared, struggling with a leg or an arm. At last they lost sight of him, and he was seen no more. Poor boy, said the fishermen who were collected on the shore, and murmuring a prayer, they returned home. That's the end of the chapter. The next chapter, which I'll read tomorrow, is... I bring water. You interrupted me. Is Pinocchio arrives at the island of the industrious bees and finds the fairy again. Oh, we, the, the fairy returns. Thank you very much. She this has back, been. Back to you. I, who yeah. is that? Uh, that's Uncle Carrie. Hi, Uncle Carrie. Right. Thank you. This has been a Blair's Library. Hi. Have a good evening. I never met you, but I will. <laughs>